dear friends september 11 will ever remain a proud moment in the history of india for it was on this day 128 years ago and young till then unknown indian monk swami vivekananda took america and through it the civilized world at large by storm with his brief but astonishingly captivating and illuminating opening address at the parliament of religions in chicago this resulted in a paradigm shift in human thinking attitudes and values the aftermath of which is still evident the renowned british historian al basham called samiji as one of the main molders of the modern world and the great philosopher c m jord termed samiji's address as the first counter attack from the east but this attack or better still revolution was not brought about through any brutal warfare or organized religious conquest involving bloodshed and sufferings but through a positive transformation of minds and hearts and for that reason peaceful highly beneficial and lasting it was done through the awakening of the dormant spirit within through the life giving all loving universal and eternal vedantic truths of the essential divinity of every soul unity of existence and the harmony of all religions it was also the fulfillment of the deep earning of man to break down all man made barriers of religion caste creed or nationality and fuse all into one humanity vasudeva kudumbagam on the basis of their spiritual oneness the second half of the 19th century was ripe for a man of swamiji's stature to appear and demonstrate what true and universal religion is as revealed by the great rishis of yoga and proved so subsequently by numerous mahatmas and sages down the ages and by his own master sri ramakrishna in the modern age this was necessary to put an end to the religious strife discord and fanaticism threatening the very survival of mankind it was also the need of the hour to awaken his own countrymen who had all fallen into ignorance self forgetfulness and poverty and some into slavish imitation of their masters the british he wanted to make them aware of the greatness and relevance of their own culture and religion to revitalize and motivate them to do heroic deeds befitting the rich heritage for the regeneration of their country how was swami ji equipped to carry out this twofold divine mission single handedly the three great formative influences that molded the personality of swami ji according to sister nivedita were the shastras the guru and the motherland in other words his profound knowledge of the eastern and western cultures his holy association with and uncommon training by his mentor and master sri ramakrishna and the direct experiences gained by his wanderings throughout the length and breadth of his beloved motherland of these his association with his master who was the living commentary of the vedas and who lived in one life the religious experiences of 300 million people for the past 2000 years ranked the foremost his was a religion in practice and whose life itself was verily a parliament of religions and who showed that all religions if truly followed would lead to the same goal the great master groomed his chosen disciple to carry out the divine mission for the modern age to be his instrument and channel of his powers and spokesman of his message he made his disciple realize that nirvikalpa samadhi or personal salvation is not 
the be all and the end all of true spirituality. He exhorted his disciple that Jiva is Shiva and that to serve man, considering him as God himself, is real worship. He predicted unerringly that Naren would one day shake the world to its foundations by his intellectual and spiritual powers and also regenerate his own country by following the nation's age-old ideals of renunciation and selfless service. During his wanderings all over the country after the Mahasamadhi of his master, Swamiji came face to face with the stark reality of poverty, ignorance, weakness, and even religious exploitation and superstitions. He was, however, co convinced that it was not the fault of religion as such, but because true religion was nowhere followed even in the country of its origin. But he was quite unsure how he could accomplish this twin task, world moving and nation building. To Sharatchandra Gupta, the station master at Hatras station, who became his first disciple, he confided, My son, I have a great mission to fulfill and I am in despair at the smallness of my power. My guru asked me to dedicate my life for the regeneration of my motherland. Spirituality has fallen to low ebb and starvation stalks the land. India must become dynamic again and earn the respect of the world through her spiritual power. It was at the end of his wanderings during his three days and nights of meditation at Kanyagumari that the means of achieving his mission opened up before him. He decided to heed the suggestion of his friends and admirers and with the blessings of his master and holy mother to go to America to participate in the Chicago Parliament of Religions to gain recognition and prestige for Indian culture and spirituality. Besides affecting a positive shift in Western thinking about India, he thought it would create a new confidence and strength among Indians themselves. The seeds of an organization of selfless sannyasins for the regeneration of the country were also sown in his mind during his meditation. He told one of his Guru Bhais just before his departure to America that he understood the truth of his master's words. There is now so much power in me now, he said. I feel as though I could revolutionize the world. From now on, he never looked back, but forged ahead with the total conviction and adamantine firmness. Penniless, friendless, in a distant strange land, the young monk had to undergo difficulties and uncertainties of all kinds. But the invisible hands of destiny and his master held and guided him, and at last he made his appearance at the opening session of the parliament. His commanding presence, dignified confidence, majestic bearing, grace, yellow and orange robes, shining face and youthful features had already made him the focus of attention of the 7,000 odd strong audience comprising the cream of American society in that huge Columbus Hall of the Art Palace. At last, he rose to speak and in his deep, rich, musical voice addressed them as sisters and brothers of America. No sooner had he uttered these five simple words than hundreds rose in their seats and applauded him for minutes together. What was the magic in those words? These words were so natural and candid with the warmth and intimacy of a loving brother and the audience felt it as such. The response was spontaneous and electrifying. These words came from the very depth of his soul who truly realized what he said. It was the perennial message of Vedanta, ever fresh and changeless, where there is no distinction of any kind, including, nation, including 
nationalities. It was a communion of souls, a fraction of what he himself had experienced at the feet of his great master. The placing of sisters before brothers was also significant. When the applause subsided, from his tongue of flame came forth the following sentiments. He thanked the American people for their warm welcome and thanked them in the name of the most ancient Vedic order of sannyasins, in the name of the mother of all religions, and in the name of the Hindus of all classes and sects. Note how he quietly asserts the antiquity and the very source of all other religions and in that unity in diversity which characterize Hinduism. Remember, this was the time when Hinduism was denounced abroad as heathen, barbaric and beset with evil practices, superstitions and meaningless rituals. Now, stretching himself to his full, with his head held high and full of justifiable pride in his religion, race and country, the young virile monk affirmed that he was proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. He made it clear that the Hindus do not believe in mere tolerance, but that they accept all religions as true. He then gave proof after proof of how his country sheltered and is still sheltering the persecuted who were driven out of those very countries who now talked of religious tolerance. The reiteration of the words, I am proud, gave a decisive and fatal blow to the citadel of lies and deceits deliberately built up to condemn Hinduism by the missionaries and the vested interests. If tolerance and universal love were to be the ideals before the parliament, then India and India alone had the first claim for them because she had practiced them even from times immemorial. The very religion of India, in fact, enjoins upon its adherence not only to observe religious harmony, but accept all religions as true. Here, Sri Ramakrishna, who had realized as many faiths, so many paths, is speaking through his disciple. Swamiji quotes from the Hindu scriptures, the Gita and the Shiva Mahima Stotram to clinch his argument that all paths, however diverse they may be, ultimately lead to the same goal. He concludes his speech, which is less than 500 words, cautioning the world not to fall again a prey to sectarianism, bigotry and fanaticism as it had already caused needless bloodshed and destruction. He hoped that the parliament would be a turning point in the history of mankind as it would put an end to fanaticism of all kinds and usher in a world of peace and love based on the realization of the inherent divinity of man and harmony of religions. Thus, Swamiji, who was a condensed India himself, made full use of the very first chance to present before the world the true universal and eternal principles of Vedanta. His subsequent speeches, both at the parliament and later all over in America and Europe, including England, during the next four years or so, were mainly elaborations and variations of these basic principles. In another lecture at the parliament, he accurately differentiates the Eastern culture from its Western counterpart by these five simple words. E divinities on earth, sinners. The first four words depict the Indian view of men, children of immortal bliss, Amardasya Putra. And the last question, sinners, denotes the Western view which he vehemently objects to. It is a sin, he says, to call a man a sinner because he is really soul immortal, spirit free, blessed and eternal and not mere matter or body. In fact, the true religion 
aims at manifesting one's inherent divinity with its infinite power, infinite knowledge and indomitable energy in every movement of life through the various yogas, karma, bhakti, knowledge or psychic control, either singly or in combination and be free. We are like lions, he says elsewhere, but deluded into thinking that we are mere lambs. In the final session of the parliament, Swamiji gives a clarion call to help and not fight, assimilation and not distraction, harmony and peace and not dissensions. The Vedantic society Swamiji established to consolidate his gains has since grown in numbers, not only in America, but all over the world and have helped to popularize the Indian wisdom. The seeds of Vedanta and Yoga Swamiji planted have since grown and started bearing fruits. There is a widespread feeling now that the Indian wisdom alone is the lasting solution to the human problems, both inner and outer, to gain mental peace as also world peace. More and more people abroad now call themselves spiritual and not religious. In these days of globalization and communication revolution, when physical distance has become a thing of the past, but the mental distance has assumed alarming proportions, the need for Vedanta is all the more urgent and relevant. Toynbee, the well-known historian, pointed out that at this supremely dangerous moment in human history, when every nation has armed itself with devastating weapons and are brought to point-blank range of each other, the only way of salvation for mankind is the Indian way, because it alone teaches man to know and love each other. Not the words to know and to love, because to know who truly we are is to love one another, and that in fact is the crux of Vedanta. The ghastly terrorist attack on the World Trade Center on this very day in 2001 and a series of bomb blasts and violence all over the world are rude reminders as to what happened if we do not care to listen to this sagely wisdom. After accomplishing his first mission, that is world shaking and world moving, Swamiji began in right earnest his second mission, that is national regeneration. His success at the Parliament of Religions and his astounding popularity in America and England galvanized the Indians as never before, as was witnessed by the hero's welcome he received on his return. He knew that one blow outside India will result in 100,000 within India. His speeches from Colombo to Almora and the establishment of Ramakrishna Mat and Mission with its motto of Atmano Moksharta Jagat Hidayaja to one's own salvation and for the welfare of all aroused the dormant consciousness of the country and faith in its culture and religion. His call especially to the youth to uplift the poor, neglected masses and women was taken up enthusiastically. Although not directly involved in the freedom struggle, Swamiji inspired countless men, including Gandhiji, Bose, Tilak, Arabindo, Tagore, to name but a few. He could enlist the support of foreigners, including Sister Nibedida, to the Indian cause. Swamiji was instrumental in creating a national consciousness in India, which eventually paved the way for freedom. He was truly the father of Indian nationalism and the guiding force behind the modern renaissance in India. His nationalism, however, was neither narrow nor partisan. He wanted India to rise not only for herself, but also to play her destined role of guiding the world. No wonder Rajaji, the elder statesman, stated that Vivekananda saved Hinduism and saved India. But for him, we would not have got freedom, so we owe everything to him. 
Tamarola, the twin star of the Paramahamsa, that is Sri Ramakrishna, and the hero who translated his thoughts into action, that is Vivekananda, dominates and guides her Indian destinies. The present leaders of India, the king of thinkers, that is Arabindo, the king of poets, that is Tagore, and the Mahatma, that is Gandhiji, have all grown, flowered, and borne fruit under the double constellation of the swan, Sri Ramakrishna, and the eagle, Vivekananda. Thus, Swamiji fulfilled the twin tasks enjoined upon him by his master in an astonishingly short span of his life, in about seven years or so, before he breathed his last at the young age of less than 40. The means used in both cases is Vedanta as preached, practiced and adapted to suit the modern age by his master. It doesn't condemn Western civilization as such, nor does it approve of all that Indian tradition has accumulated over the centuries. Equilibrium and synthesis, in fact, constitute Swamiji's creative genius. He found many virtues in the West, like their work culture, civic sense, organizational skill, democratic spirit, and scientific temper. He wanted the East and the West come together and share the merits of each other for the good of both. In his comprehensive vision, he integrated all aspects of life, material and spiritual, science and religion, the secular and the sacred, the East and the West, the past and the present, idealism and practicality, and meditation and action. And he himself lived them all. While the West have to learn from India the conquest of internal nature, India has to learn from the West the conquest of external nature. But he cautioned that while doing so, care should be taken to maintain their distinct identities and not one becoming the other, because each nation has an individuality to maintain, a destiny to fulfill, a message to deliver, and a mission to accomplish. And in the case of India, it is spirituality. The Vedanta societies abroad and the Ramakrishna muts and missions within the country imparting spiritual illumination and humanitarian activities satisfying both spiritual hunger and physical hunger are living testimonies of Swamiji's message of harmony between the East and the West. These institutions paved the way for similar organizations to come up and flourish for the betterment of men. Lastly, Swamiji's teachings are chiefly addressed to the youth on whom he lay his faith and hope. He was confident that they, if they are rightly inspired and motivated, would carry out his teachings like lions. How far have we how far have we been true followers of Swamiji? The one important area where we have miserably failed, I think, is in the field of education, where Swamiji had laid the greatest emphasis and the one solution for all the problems, individual and national. By true education, he meant life-giving, man-making, character-making, and nation-building assimilation of ideas, wherein all the faculties of man, physical, mental, intellectual, moral, and spiritual, are harmonized so that the educated manifests what is best and perfect in him in thought, word, and deed. We are yet to have such an education wherein spirituality and morality are cardinal features, where character is given pride of place and which impel one to do acts of renunciation and selfless service for others, especially the poor and the neglected. Only enlightened citizens can create an enlightened nation. As it is, our education at best only caters to the material needs with the result that it makes them utterly selfish and narrow-minded. 
in the absence of higher ideals there is the danger of their falling easy prey to base instincts or to negative ideologies thereby causing harm to themselves and the nation although 60% of our population consists of people below 30 we are yet to harness this mighty youth power for the betterment of the country somebody once said that he is a voice without a form which means that he is not to be worshiped as a person but he wanted us to practice his teachings he also exhorts the youth that if only they can manifest the infinite potentialities hidden within them every one of them can become like him on this chicago commemoration day let us resolve ourselves to study and understand swamiji and put into practice what we have assimilated that alone is the fitting tribute we can pay to this universal soul the man among men who will continue to be the supreme source of inspiration for generations to come jai hind